Great to have you with us. Now, the Electoral Commission is holding an urgent meeting with political parties and members of its eminent advisory committee over its decision to compile a new voters' register. The meeting comes after the inter-party resistance against the new voters' register, led by the opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, made a sudden turnaround and announced the decision of a series of protests against the EC's decision to compile a new voters' register for the polls. The commission, in its quest to resolve concerns by the opposing party, said these parties will be consulted on the best method to use when compiling the new register. We'll take you to the grounds for that meeting soon, but before that, Member of Parliament for Second D, Andrew Ejapa Mercer, says the consequences of deferring the compilation of a new register may be potentially explosive for the nation and it will be prudent to do it now. Speaking on the AM show, Mr. Mercer said the NDC has no moral ground to raise the issue of cost on the matter. Even though the EC had mentioned at the meeting of the IPAC that they were going to commence the process of pro procuring a new voters register. That item was not an agenda item. And so it could not have been the case that because it wasn't an agenda item, yeah. no discussion could be held or it could not be said that the parties were invited to make a contribution and take a definitive decision on that. And of course, the Buhaha evolved, the back and forth, the demonstrations, and all that. I say it is needless because, you see, Roland, I've heard the arguments. Cost, one. And I ask, so which is more expensive? Going into an election with the political environment that we find ourselves in, where the elections management body has indicated that the system that they are running on today, they themselves cannot verify its reliability into election 2020. Which is more expensive? Leave that hanging so that a potential crisis can evolve for the system to break down potentially in December, for us to cry wolf that the EC knowing very well that this system was unreliable, proceeded to use it in election 2020, or that we ought to put in place a new system that ensures that we are all certain about the outcome of the 2020 election, which is more expensive. Cost, then this is telling us about cost. This is a request that has gone through due process. But Member of Parliament for Mion Mohammed Abdulaziz argued that the move by the Commission suggests ulterior motive. He questions the need for fixing a register that the EC has already assessed as credible. I'm looking for a credible register for a credible elections. You cannot have a credible free and fair elections when you don't have a credible register. The EC themselves have told us that the register that we have today is credible. I have heard Jane Mensa herself indicate publicly that the register is credible. If the thing is not broken, why fix it? Well, they what have motive? Much. What motive do you have in fixing a register? Have you not that heard the yourself. Commission say concretely that uh, sometimes you, the fingerprints of uh, some voters uh, is not able to be picked, so they have see, to rely on see, they have to see, rely on manual manual verification. That argument is a limping one, and that cannot stand. I don't get you. It cannot stand because when you say that um, some people are not able to go through the biometric um, verification. In the last election that we had, the district assembly um, elections, those who were not verified by the DVDs was just about 0.6%. What it means that 99.4% were able to pass through the DVDs. Now you are talking about facial recognition app. That says that in black communities, the success rate is about 80%. If you have um, a system that can guarantee you over 99%, why do you want to now go and bring a facial recognition that cannot give you even 90% uh, success rate? That argument doesn't hold. And look, 
the NPP and uh, the EC must just get this thing right. That Ghana is not just about them alone. We all have a duty to protect the democracy that we have been able to nature up to this time and that will not allow you to throw this country what into, do you mean by into, the MPP into, and the Electoral into. Commission? It's not well, the position well, of the MPP. Well, the it's MPP, the position of the Electoral the MPP Commission. Is the MPP is them. says that they find the, nothing wrong The MPP with. is backing them, and I can tell you, I would, not, I would not have any material evidence to support it, that what the EC is doing is with the tacit support and approval of the President and the, and the, and the MPP as a party. It's alive on Joy News today. Information we have is that the Electoral Commission is currently making its presentation to the various political parties and the Eminent Advisory Committee at the Coconut Grove Regency Hotel here in Accra. We will bring you the very latest from that meeting later in the bulletin. But in the meantime, the Upper West Region will receive 13 instead of 11 ambulances from the One Constituency, One Ambulance Program instituted by government. Upper West Administrative Officer of the National Ambulance Service, Osman Mahmoud, disclosed, though the region has 11 constituencies, they will have two more following an intervention from the regional minister for the two to be allocated for the WA Airport and the WA Campus of the University for Development Studies. Joy News' Upper West correspondent Rafiq Salam reports that the arrival of eight out of an initial 11 for the constituencies in the region is seen as a good omen in a region where emergency health care is nothing to write home about. This is the War Operations Office of the National Ambulance Service located in a building which is a relic of the colonial administration and sandwiched by the War Sacred Court and the War Municipal Office of the Ghana National Fire Service. In front of the office and at the extreme right are two ambulances parked. One looks fairly new and the other certain on the jaded or worn out ties. Upper West Regional Administrative Officer of the National Ambulance Service, Osman Mahmoud, explained that the number of ambulances in the region over the years has been undulating. The ambulances goes in and out. You can bring five of them in today. Then the next day, three of them or all will go out because they were over age. So cost of maintenance was the challenge. So before we came, we're having three. And currently we speak, it's only one that is functioning. The blunt truth, however, is that this is the only ambulance that residents of the one municipality and some other districts depended on for the past year. There are times that it malfunctioned, but yet has to push the former Upper West Region Hospital to be patients who are referred out of the municipality. This reporter was a victim six months ago when he had two fractures on his left leg as a result of a motorbike accident and had to be transported to the Nandam Hospital for surgery. Ambulance that came to pick me was not in good condition uh, because uh, the smoke that was coming out from the ambulance, one couldn't bear it. And it was there that uh, all the people who were gathered, they realized that this ambulance couldn't, couldn't, couldn't take me to Nandom. You can imagine a whole regional hospital at war where there's no ambulance uh, to take somebody to another referral uh, center, like back in the whole of Upper West Region at the regional hospital. I was lucky and had this opportunity of a land cruiser what about other people who doesn't have such opportunities? How are they transported to these hospitals? Some concerned residents in the region before then saw the need of an ambulance for the region and went on a campaign on social media to appeal for funds. It yielded positive results, but are so far fell short of the amount required to buy a new ambulance. The arrival of eight out of 11 ambulances under the one constituency one ambulance program is therefore good omen for a region whose emergency health care system is nothing to write home about. With the help of Honorable Regional Minister, a request was also made to get additional two of them for WA Airport and then the University of Development Studies, the WA Campus, which is isolated from the town. So we have a positive response on that one. So next week, if God bless or when they will go for those ones to make 30, uh, uh, 13 of the vehicles in Upper West. 
Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, who received the ambulances for onward delivery to the various constituencies, warned they are for the living and not for the dead. We will not allow anybody to use them to carry dead bodies. That is not the purpose of an ambulance. Anybody who wants to convey a dead body from the mortuary to a destination know the sort of vehicle that they can procure or go for, and not an ambulance. Reporting for Jue News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Now, the Volta Regional Minister, Dr. Archibald Lecture, has described as witchcraft anyone who questions the motive to organize a ceremony to redistribute ambulances commissioned by the president three days ago. He further categorizes people who criticize the move as those who need deliverance. At a ceremony at the Volta Regional Coordinating Council for Onward Distribution of the Ambulances, the Regional Minister took a swipe at all, including journalists, for questioning the need to organize another program after the national one. He believes the program is tailored to serve the needs of the people in the region. Uh, I think that when something good happens in our country, we should be happy. Because if, if good things happen, we are not happy. That is equivalent to witchcraft. <laughs> After the president inaugurated, commissioned the ambulances, he went to the whole West ambulance and he inspected it. Soon after that, news went around that the whole West ambulance was missing. I don't know whether it was spiritually missing or physically missing. Then yesterday, when the ambulances arrived in town, and went around town, I had calls. Why are people wasting government fuel? They don't want the people to know that even the ambulances have arrived. They don't want the people to know. Then I heard something on City News that uh, Water Regional Minister is recommissioning executives of the NDC in the whole central constituency are angry over a decision by the Regional Minister Archibolecha to recommission some ambulances returned assigned to the region. Then I also read a statement by the whole central NDC, the recommissioning of ambulances by the Volta Regional Minister, an act of mediocrity. I want to put on record that Ghana is a unitary state. We have the national level, we have the regional level, and we have the district and assembly level. So everybody in Ghana must know, including journalists, that Ghana has a national, we have a national level government, we have a regional community council, and then we have assemblies. So when the president performs a commissioning ceremony at the national level, the people of Ghana, many of whom might not have watched on television, might not have read newspapers, also need to know what has happened. And when ambulances have been allocated to Volta region, there is nothing wrong with the ambulances coming to the coordinating council for us to receive them and hand them over to be taken care of by the assemblies. Anybody who criticizes this has a problem. Uh, we need to take him to synagogue for deliverance. We'll soon take you to the ambulance command center so we understand how these ambulances are working here in Accra. But in the meantime, Parker Wilson has joined us from the Coconut Grove Regency Hotel where the Electoral Commission is holding an urgent meeting with political parties and members of their eminent advisory committee. Parker, what can you report from the meeting grounds? Right, Daniel, first of all, uh, just behind me is the block where the, the Electoral Commission and the political parties are having the meeting and there is heavy security presence here at this morning or this afternoon. If you have been to Coconut Grove before, Daniel, if you walk into the entrance where the checkpoint is, normally you get to see about two private security guards the managers of Coconut Grove uh, have uh, employed to check uh, security. But today it is quite different. About 30 police.
police officers have been deployed to this ground to ensure law and order. My source tells me that the Electoral Commission picked up information that perhaps some group of individuals will be massing up at the gates to cause trouble or foment trouble. And the, that's the reason why they have required the services of the Ghana Police Service to provide security to ensure law and order. Now, let me take you to the meeting, Daniel. The meeting, I am told that the Electoral Commission is currently making an argument as to the reason why for a new register. And so the director of IT is putting together their argument and they are still making the argument of cost as to why the upgrade will be more expensive than procuring a new uh, biometric equipment. Uh, I have with me the chief executive officer for ASEPA, uh, Mr. Thompson, who has been in the meeting. And uh, Daniel, let me find out from him. I mean, you have been in the meeting. What exactly is going on in the meeting, sir? Yes, I think uh, currently the Electoral Commission just finished their presentation. Um, they've raised a number of issues. Um, a primary of them are that the machines are obsolete, and so um, they, they need to replace. Some of them are, are, are outmoded. Some of them have lost repla irreplaceable parts and what have you, and so they need to be replaced. Um, they've also raised the issue of cost comparison. They did a, a cost comparison with, um, with uh, the cost of refurbishing the, the, the old system and also the cost of uh, procuring a new system. Them and they've raised the argument that um, I mean the the cost of procuring a new system is much cheaper than refurbishing the existing system, and 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 so primary these are some of the the issues that have formed the core of the argument. That I'm sure they are convincing the stakeholders involved in this I process. Uh, not at all, not at all. I think you are not convinced by the. Not at all. Personally, I asked the electoral commission yeah. uh, a simple question which they've not been able to answer uh, at all, uh, 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 before I went out. I, I, I asked them about uh, the argument they made about the machines being obsolete. Yeah. And so they have to procure a new uh, system and procure a new biometric register. So I asked the, the IT director of the Electoral Commission whether if the, the new system that they are going to buy, the machines are also not going to last forever, they're also going to be obsolete. And so if those machines become obsolete, are we going to compile a new voters register? And, and his answer was no. And, 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 and I said, so then why are you using that as a justification now to compile a new voters register, he couldn't um, answer that as well. He also made the issue about the the source code that uh, currently the source code of, of the current system is with ex an external entity or an external vendor, and so the electoral commission do not have access to the system. Then again, we asked the commission that okay, we agree, we I understand that with the STL deal, um, the the parties agreed at IPAC that they leave the source code with a vendor. Who's, who has no interest in elections, right. who cannot you know, manipulate or... Ha and so and a, a neutral person who is outside and has no interest, instead of leaving the, the source code with a commission, okay, which will give them unlimited access into the system and could, I mean, um, just by, by either by mistake, by errors or whatever that they want to do, could, could affect you know, the outcome of the elections. And so how, if the electoral committee now wants to procure a new system, which will let them have access to the source code of the current system, they must be able to justify uh, the reasons why we must leave the source code with them. Because, uh, and they are saying that if we are trusting them to, com to, to conduct elections, then we must, we must trust them to leave the source code with them. For me, uh, so for you, the EC is not making a conversation like no, 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 not at all. I mean, and if you, if you inside there, it's just been one cajoling after the other. Because, I mean, um, I I we are yet to hear from the political parties also, and we civil society organizations are going to have the opportunity to also make a, a, a presentation. But from the EC's own arguments, clearly uh, most of the issues they've raised. Are, are quite are quite lightweight and, and finally for me do you anticipate that at the end of the day there'll be a resolution that we should push through with the compilation of a new register i, I don't think so I, I think the electoral commission if you look at their poster they are determined to compile a new voter register. Yeah. They, they look quite determined quite resolute in that decision <laughs> Only that they have not been able to carry the stakeholders along and also the people of Ghana along. And so, if they, they it, I mean, if we are not able to reach a good consensus, I think they are going to face a lot of resistance because even inside, they are facing a lot of resistance from civil society organizations and from political actors. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Thompson is the uh, convener for ASEPA, and then just as he had him, the Electoral Commission is not making a convincing argument at all. So, as far as he's concerned, at the end of the day, the opposition against the creation of the new register will continue unabated. We'll, we'll still monitor the, the process. We are told that it's going to take some time. So we'll continue to monitor, and whatever that happens, clearly we'll update our viewers on whatever that happens or the outcome of this meeting, Daniel.
Thank you very much, Parker Wilson. Exclusive access to the details there of that meeting between the Electoral Commission, the Eminent Advisory Panel, and the Interparty Resistance Against the New Voters Register, as well as some civil society actors. Expect more from that meeting in later bulletins. Now, in the meantime, officials of the National Ambulance Service Dispatch Center or Command Center are advocating strict sanctions for prank callers who interrupt the work of the emergency services. Already this morning, the service or the center has received more than 100 prank calls. The center with a call number 112, the new emergency line, is to serve as a synchronized port of call for all forms of emergencies, either police, NAGMO, fire service, and the ambulance service. Here's a prank call recorded at the ambulance command center two years ago. Where do you say? Yo, Martin, let me see. Where do you feel saying? Where do you feel saying? Where do you 48? Sir. And so, where are you paying an hour for that? What's it? Where are you paying an hour? Kweku. 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 Oh, Kase. You. Into your bar, oh, honum. Now, my now, would you, mammy, me throw our womb, fat and our womb fat. Right, let's take a, a, a stay a bit longer with this story. And my colleague Komla Adum has joined us on the phone. Uh, he has been spending some time at the Ambulance Command Center. Komla, take us through exactly what you observed when you went there. So then you always get here, you find the National Ambulance Service on the first center, which is right here in the center of the council. Komla, please reposition yourself. The line is not clear. Is it better now? Much better. Let's go. Okay. So when you get here, you get in, you find uh, 15 or more officials of the ambulance service who are seated behind their control devices and their PCs and their, their various booths, and they are receiving calls. Every minute a, a call comes through, uh, any of the booths, the um, attendants pick the call, they, they ask what the, the, the caller demands, and then they decide to reroute. If it is an emergency service for the police, they reroute the police. If it is a fire service, they do that. If it is an ambulance service proper that is required, they quickly make contact with their dispatch centers, and then the ambulance are dispatched to various district areas. But the phenomenon here, since I've been here, a lot of calls have come through. Half of those calls, according to official here, are prank calls. So you get somebody call, for example, and say he's hungry. You get somebody call and say he needs a girlfriend. Someone calls to say he needs money. And these are calls, according to officials, that are distracting the operations of the command center because on a daily basis, they receive hundreds of these calls and there's absolutely nothing they can do about the phone calls so far. So, Madame Matilda Nate, who is in charge here, is advocating, for example, a name and shame regime or even prosecution for some of these individuals who can't call the uh, command center and then back the line to other people who may be in genuine need when they call, may be unable to reach them. So that is the situation here at the command center. And then you know that now that the, all the emergency numbers have been synchronized into one, which is 112, you can imagine the number of calls that will come through and, of course, the number of town calls also that will come through. Komla, how many times have ambulances been dispatched today? So since I've been here, I've, I've had the officials dispatch at least four inter-hospital uh, ambulances, and these are just like within, within hospital, one hospital to the other, because they call and, for example, there's oxygen needed in another hospital, so then that dispatch is done 
you know, that kind of dispatches. But when it comes to, for example, an accident scene, the requirement for an ambulance, they say, I haven't had any uh, experience of a dispatch in of that meter yet. But I'll be speaking to the entire year. I'm sure I'll be here for a while. So that may happen in the course of the day. We will be there to our viewers. That can really happen. Kamala, help me understand this. So the ambulance is being used to transport implements that the hospital needs, like oxygen. Yes. That they need urgently. Yes, that is if the care facility has run out of that stock, yes. But not sick individuals per se? No. Have any we sick individuals any been sent, even from hospital to hospital? Case. There's not been any such case since I have been here. Thank you very much, Kamala Adum, for bringing us those details. Kamala will be stationed at the Ambulance Command Center, like you heard him say, all day. And so we will tell you exactly how that system runs. Now, still with healthcare, over 400 children diagnosed with various heart conditions at Konfanochi Teaching Hospital are virtually on death row because relatives cannot afford treatment costs. It costs between 2,000 and 60,000 US dollars for surgery, depending on whether the condition is simple or complex. Cardiovascular and thoracic surgeon Dr. Isaac Ochre describes the situation as demoralizing for the health professional. Ohiming Teria has more in the following report. The heart clinic at CAT sees at least 150 child and adult heart cases a week. Ghana and Senegal are the only leading West African countries where open heart surgery is undertaken daily, and there is always a backlog of cases due to high cost. The situation means patients have no option, but painfully await death. Dr. Isaac Ochre sums up frustration of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. If we take adults and children, I think it's the responsibility of the state to take care of children. Most rural countries, or by country India, health insurance covers children's surgery. And I think we should do that because we, most average Ghanaians cannot afford has any for their children. E commerce, we have more than 400 children who need surgery, but they cannot afford. And so they will progress for it to heart failure, which we can't do surgery for them. Yeah, children. Oh, on the waiting list. Waiting list. Just waiting to die. Yeah, absolutely. Some have already, some have died every year, some of them will die. 18 month old Yusuf Koli Zakaria is the only male child of Mason, Bashil Zakaria and wife. Chako Sela, Suraya at Adunfa in the Fijakwa Bay district. He was diagnosed with a complicated congenital heart condition doctors call Trancus Asteriosis. From a local hospital through Konfanochi to Kolebu, Yusif is frequently in and out of hospital for recurrent heart failure. He has one of the complex heart conditions called Trancus Arteriosis. There's a big hole he had either in the upper two chambers or between the lower two chambers. And there's also something going wrong with the main tubes or vessels that blood is supposed to flow to all parts of the body and then the lungs. Doctors say the only long-term solution is surgical reconstruction of his heart outside Ghana. Estimates from a hospital in India sent to the National Cardio Center at Kolebu put the cost at 12,000 U.S. dollars. This baby, I've been told, has been coming several times for admission because the baby has been having heart failure. And I, I'm sure I, I was told that he was even discharged from the confinement chair about a week ago because he presented with heart failure. So they're becoming a recurrent heart failure. So there's cause for recurrent, I mean, recurrent uh, admissions, of course, medications to control the heart failure. But these are just medicine drugs to control the heart failure. They are not managing or treating the actual structural anomaly. Abnormality of the heart is Yusuf's poor parents obviously are unable to raise the money, they have come to dead end. So I don't have a uh, direct hope that oh, I have to go to this place to get that kind of money. So I can see uh, I've lost hope, but I don't know by a lot grace, maybe he can. Maybe let some help come from somewhere, which I don't Dr. Autry wants children such as Yusif and several others suffering from similar fate to be taken care by the state. It's extremely sad. It says, Ghana, we are smart people. We have surgeons. We cannot pray. 
But I think that we should all advocate. We can forget about the adults, but for children, I think there should be a way that if even the whole nation, you say, surge in children $6,000, even if government takes about 30, 50%, $30,000. From Kumasi, for Joy News, Ohim Interia reporting. And coming up in business, Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry sensitizes business community on New Companies Act. Imano Abwajiwiafi joins us shortly.